And I still made an honest living as a religious affairs editor for United Press International. Two Lutheran clergymen were the most reliable sources on the growing problem of neo-Gnosticism. Cults, sects, the occult, Satanism, all spiritual perversions with which America and Europe kept reinfecting each other. One of these two is with us today. He is Pastor Larry Nichols, Second Vice President of the LCMS New England Synod, uh, District. Pardon. But I would also bow long distance to his colleague, the Reverend George Mather of St. George, Utah, who is not here today. Together with Nichols, Mather, and um, Dr. Alvin Schmidt wrote the groundbreaking encyclopedic dictionary of cults, sects, and new religions. Please welcome Larry Nichols. Here he comes. Well, good morning, and thank you for having me. I uh, very, very much appreciate these two uh, lectures by Dr. Power and Hexham. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint for you. I ran out the door uh, after 14 days in Europe uh, without my little thing that you stick into the computer there, so you'll have to rely on uh, my paper. And so uh, I don't know if there are any surprises up there that I wasn't anticipating. Um, I had the privilege of teaching several times for our synod in our uh, seminary in Russia and also for a week at the Luther Academy in uh, Latvia. And when we were greeted uh, by the uh, crowds in uh, this, the first trip was in 1996, 300 or 400 people came to our lectures and a lot of them young people. I began the, uh, my presentation by remarking that here in America we're very grateful for the Europeans bringing Christianity to our shores and we in turn respond by giving Europe back all of our cults. And, um, you know, we want to be, of course, mutually engaging here. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about the uh, present state of affairs in the uh, world of the occult here in America. One uh, anecdotal incident, and then I'll get to my paper, and it sort of summarizes the state of affairs in America. I was on my way to the hospital one day to visit someone, and I had my collar on, and uh, I was waited upon by a young lady, couldn't have been 19, 20 years old, and she, as she was taking my order, she boldly asked me, could I ask you a question? What is that thing you're wearing on your uh, neck? And I said, well, I'm a Christian minister, a minister of the gospel of Christ. And she said, what is that? And I was somewhat shocked. And I said, you have never heard of a minister or, a, or, or Christianity? And she said, no, I haven't. So I brought out my little pocket New Testament and opened it up to that verse that every Christian knows, John 3.16. And as she heard about how God loved the world that he gave his son, she was sort of moved by that and said, I'd like to find out more. And so I gave her a card and we uh, never did speak again. I went back to the restaurant and she never did contact me. I'm hoping the words of Paul, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. But it sort of, my point for bringing it up to you is, is that it does indeed summarize the state of affairs of Christianity in America. I teach at Rhode Island College as well as pastor my congregation. And most of the kids today that are coming in to the courses that I teach have no clue what traditional Orthodox Christianity actually teaches, but are rather gaining the cues more from the world of paganism, neo-paganism, and the occult, symbols of which they are very, very familiar. And now, of course, to the paper. One cannot understand the present state of affairs in the world of the occult in America without at least a cursory tracing of how we got to where we are. I could not do this subject justice in the small amount of time allotted to me for this conference. We're talking here basically about the history of ideas. Unfortunately or fortunately, whichever the case may be, theology always seems to clump along behind philosophy 
And after ideas have been popularized by the philosophers and the cultural ideologues of the day, of which we've heard some of, the theologians then nervously step forward to change, fine-tune, and adjust to the new and prevailing ideas in order to keep lockstep with the latest trends and the hope that the church will continue to remain relevant to the culture. We must begin to understand the present by going it back at least, at the very least, to the Enlightenment. The so-called philosophes of the age of reason were succeeding, so they thought, in eliminating the miraculous and all of the superstitions from Christianity. Belief in a literal devil was thought to be banished, like Dante's Inferno, into the world of grim fairy tales. All of the ghosts and goblins were being fast cleared away from the forests and the glens, as now man was coming of age, and reason was replacing faith as the new epistemological criteria for knowledge. In America, religion was largely appealing to the moral nature of man. Interests turned towards a utilitarian outlook, largely based upon pragmatism and the prevailing philosophy of individualism being forged by Protestant work ethic and the pick yourself up by the bootstraps philosophy of life. Philosopher Alistair McIntyre has put it in a very important book he's written called After Virtue, puts it this way, and I quote, the emergence of the individual freed on the one hand from the social bonds of those constraining hierarchies which the modern world rejected at its birth, and on the other hand from what modernity has taken to be the superstitions of teleology. To, th to say this, of course, is to move a little too quickly beyond my present argument, but it is to note that the peculiarly modern self, the emotivist self, acquiring sovereignty in its own realm, lost its traditional boundaries provided by a social identity and a view of human life as ordered to a given end." Unquote. I want to pick up on two phrases of uh, Dr. McIntyre, constraining hierarchies and superstitions of teleology. These are, of course, are concepts that have long since left the modern censored epistemological marketplace of accepted or even relevant theological or philosophical ideas. Today's cultured despisers of religion, long since dispensing with a Platonic and Aristotelian philosophical frame of reference, that is to say, an ontological conception of the world that embraced hierarchy and telos. And see, Dr. Uh, McIntyre, I should explain, is thinking, as is, of course, trained in the classics, of the philosophers. In the ancient world, there was the concept Plato and Aristotle, of a hierarchical dimension to life. Plato arrived at the notion that reason and the good were the highest, and then, of course, the material world takes its place in the hierarchy. And then along with that, there is purpose. Aristotle himself assigns purpose to matter and to life and to causation. And so the worldly philosophers realized this, and, of course, from Plato developed the hierarchical notion that came full bloom in Gnosticism in the early church. But of course, as we go to, uh, in fact, the sermon this morning, based on the text, Dr. Meyer, talking about uh, setting your affection on the things above, not on the things of this world. There's a place called heaven, there's a place called earth, as I think he said. In other words, there's an up there and a down here, a hierarchical dimension to life. That's what McIntyre is saying is completely missing in the world today. So I pick up with uh, the paper here. McIntyre is indeed on to something here. A loss of hierarchy on the one hand has resulted in the loss of transcendence. A loss of teleology on the other hand directs the modern culture's gaze away from objective theological moorings. The implications of this are momentous. The result being essentially that since the nature and uh, since nature and grace are divorced in modern thinking, infinite and qualitative distinctions are no longer possible. What we have in the modern world is a flat, static uh, positivism on the one hand or emotivism on the other. In other words, what we come to know, what we say is knowable, is only achieved through what the scientific paradigm tells us or what flatly people sort of existentially feel as they emote feelings. 
It is the thesis of this paper, however, that they live on. These, this need for hierarchy in telos lives on in pre-Christian paganism, paganism i.e., the world of the occult as it presently rages in America. I jump quickly to the turbulent decade of the 1960s. Beatnik comedian Lenny Bruce well summarized the pop cultural trend of the decade of Woodstock. Hendrix and Joplin's untimely deaths, the assassinations of the Kennedys, Dr. King, the shootings at Kent State, the era of the psychedelic drug craze, and to quote Lenny Bruce, quote, Truth is what is. A lie is anything that tries to frustrate what is, unquote. Truth for Bruce was not anything objective that one would encounter as a judge and arbiter of what is right or wrong outside of the subjective self. Indeed, anything extraneous, like a law that says thou shalt not, is the real enemy because it prevents the freedom of self-expression, self-indulgence, and unbridled hedonism. It was this trendy spirit that would popularize the notion that not only uh, should authority be questioned, it should ultimately be rejected. And this included, of course, religious authority. Now, Lenny Bruce had a precedent. I started out the paper by talking about the Enlightenment in 1789, a prisoner in the Bastille right prior to the revolution was a man by the name of the Marquis de Sade. De Sade was a prisoner in the Bastille, and he cried out to the crowds as they were storming the place that he was being tortured for liberty's sake. And of course, de Sade's writings, very popular in the day, the pornogra pornographic nature of his writings was the reason he was in prison. But de Sade, anticipating Darwin somewhat, and certainly reflected in Bruce in the 60s, backed the philosophers of the day up against the wall who wanted genteel morality without God. And he said that if there is no God, there is no extraneous authority. And if there is no authority that says thou shalt or thou shalt not, then one is free to follow their brute instinct. And for Desaad, his brute instinct was to rape, plunder, and pillage. But it was sort of a forerunner to the Darwinistic worldview that, uh, of course, Lenny Bruce in the 60s reflected. John Lennon of the Beatles promised, we are going to steal your children. And then came 1970, the publication of Fritz Joff Coppra's Turning Point, Science, Society, and Rising Culture, and his other work, The Tao of Physics. These works signaled the beginning of what has been popularly known as the New Age Movement. There's so much to write about the New Age that it's actually the third longest article in my book. The first one is uh, Mormonism. You can never stop writing about Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and again, the New Age movement in that order. The Fifth Dimensions, Marilyn McCoo would sing that this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This New Age is now a world of harmony understanding, and understanding the lyrics continue. It is a world of earth religion a world where old pagan ideas were resurrected and popularized under new names. This is the world where John Lennon could imagine that there's no heaven. It's easy if you try, unquote. At least Karl Marx in his manifesto thought it'd be difficult for people to eliminate belief in heaven. All of the popular magazines of the period, Time, Life, Esquire, McCall's, and Harper, featured articles on the occult. Popular celebrities and Hollywood stars all came forward as practitioners of the new age. Major universities featured new curriculums of courses in the occult. Bookstores featured major sections dedicated to the new age, astrology, divination, crystal gazing, palmistry, Ouija boards, numerology, I Ching, witchcraft, neo-paganism, Satanism, and incidentally in our book we list five different kinds of Satanism, spiritualism, paranormal experiences, a revival of interest in ufology, and so forth and so on. In essence, we have witnessed a veritable paradigm shift in our present-day American culture. 
Our culture is no longer taking its cues from the biblical world, and the Christian church is fast fading into oblivion in its ability to communicate the timeless truths of the gospel of Christ. America has become a breeding ground for the explosion of cults, the occult, and a salad bar variety of alternative religions and spiritualities. Indeed, McIntyre was right. While science flattened out the world by removing hierarchy and telos, purpose, these basic realities would live on in the world of the occult in America. Of course, there is evangelicalism that we think is coming along to save the day, but this has become yet another form of American individualism. As long as one has Jesus as one's personal savior, he or she will not need, any, need anything like the church or the sacramental life as vital ways of receiving the gifts and graces of God, the true hierarchy and telos. The guru of evangelicalism, Carl F. H. Henry, laments that the Achilles heel of the movement is that there's no concept of what the church even is. In his 1976 book, Evangelicals in Search of an Identity, the title tells the entire story. The new occult alternative to the Judeo-Christian worldview is featured by several identifiable components. Sociolo sociologist Ronald N. Roth lists three. The first is, quote, the promise of godhood and the divinity of humanity. All forms of the occult insist that the true or real human self is synonymous with God. We just heard very eloquently the two previous lectures, these themes absolutely echoed in Feuerbach and in Hinduism and so forth. The next prominent feature is that all is one, which is essentially pantheism, a major underpinning of the New Age movement. Here the basic idea is that there is only one basing, basic ordering of reality, in other words, a monism. The creator-creation cre uh, creator distinction prevalent in Christian thought, Romans 1.25, they worshiped and served the creation more than the creator, is completely removed in the world of the occult. There is no essential difference between natural and supernatural, good and evil, God and Satan. The third essential component of the occult in America today is that the new purpose, tell us, is to achieve awareness of the divinity within. Salvation is no longer a matter of sin for which we need forgiveness as, as, it, as it is a matter of ignorance for which we need enlightenment or knowledge. And the knowledge comes in the form of meditation which leads to the knowledge that the self is God. Sound like Feuerbach? The new enlightened person will rise above morality now these features of the occult are nothing new. They are major themes within the Gnosticism of the early church fathers uh, that the uh, Gnosticism of the early church fathers combated so vehemently. It is not surprising that Harold Bloom, for example, argues quite convincingly that America is a modern haven of Gnosticism. I quote from his book, The Religion of the American People, quote, Obsession with the American varieties of Gnosticism, of enthusiasm, antinomianism, seems to be driven by the concern of what I call the American religion. No Western nation is so religion-soaked as ours. As Americans, we are obsessed also with information, as we regard religion as the most vital aspect of information. I reflect that Gnosticism was, and is, a kind of information theory. Matter and energy are rejected or at least placed under the sign of negation. Information becomes the emblem of salvation. The false cre creation fall uh, concern matter and energy, but the pl pleroma or fullness, the original abyss, is all information. Only a Gnostic reading of the Bible can make us into the land of promise. The new irony of American history is that we fight now to make the world safe for Gnosticism, indeed our sense of religion, unquote. Why the new Gnosticism? Jeffrey Russell has argued that the interest in the occult has grown significantly in periods of rapid social breakdown. 
when establishments cease to provide readily acceptable answers and people turn elsewhere for assurance. This was true in the early centuries as Christianity encountered the world at the decline of the uh, Roman society, as it is also certainly true in the breakdown of the fabric of society today here in America. <coughs> Excuse me. We pointed out at the beginning that the roots of the current revival date back to the Enlightenment. But this spills over into the 19th century. One cannot ignore the attack on Christianity and the roots for the foundations of pagan and occult beliefs being steadily crafted in the 19th century, or that is to say, moving from the Enlightenment to the Romantic period. <coughs> Darwin would present the new evolutionary paradigm in his Origin of Species. And by the way, Queen Victoria has been quite a prominent personality in uh, today, the, the sermon, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lectures here. So I send you my version of Queen Victoria when she was... Uh, finished reading Darwin's Origin of Species, she was supposed to have said, thank goodness I don't have to believe any of those horrible Old Testament stories any longer, unquote. Karl Marx would relocate the human struggle away from a sin to a this-worldly dialectical materialism. Sigmund Freud would direct our feelings of guilt away from a spiritual state of sin before God who would hold us to account and instead argue that our guilt is directed towards our own psychological development and fixations upon paternal relationships. Biblical scholarship in the 19th century, and we've heard again from David Strauss and Feuerbach, uh, biblical scholarship was steadily busy with the new criticisms and eventually the quest for the historical Jesus. Yet in the meantime, there was no small amount of attention given to all of these developments in the world of the occult. With this 19th century attack upon Christendom, <coughs> a multiple host of occult religions came to the forefront. Spiritualism, transcendentalism, theosophy, Christian science, new thought, Eastern religions, all combined with the new American spirit of individualism and belief in the innate goodness of man. The old boundaries carefully drawn by the Ten Commandments could no longer be foisted upon those who would pursue the American dream of a pursuit of happiness. Christianity as an organized constraint, the law, so we can start to sound a little like Lutherans, has been replaced by the new spirituality. And my students, by the way, oftentimes are fond of placing a distinction between religion and spirituality, the former being organized and rejected, spirituality being the desired alternative. The occult provides the many varieties for this new sensibility. Yet there remains a spiritual thirst that ultimately cannot be satiated by the occult. It does not provide the longed for answers. The church simply must continue to present the gospel. And she must do this by critiquing the evangelical forms of Christianity that are so much more popular on the American scene that, I think, draw attention away from the gospel. As long as Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth and the left-behind books and movies continue to present a form of Christianity that can so easily be caricatured, people will continue to turn to the new message of the age of Aquarius. As long as the epistemological shift away from the cognitive to the visceral and the experiential, then the occult, which is built upon experience and feelings, will continue to dominate the American landscape. The diagnosis of the human condition is sin. The occult diverts the gaze away from this theological reality and redirects it towards psychology and therapeutic techniques predicated upon human potential and the beneficence of human nature and progress. And finally, Christianity alone presents the true sense of what is sacred. It presents to us tr the true hierarchy as we are called to have no other gods before the one true God. It presents before us true telos, purpose, as Jesus declares he is the way, the truth, and the life. It presents to the world that God is renewing the world not through this worldly utopias 
or through the occult quest of discovering them or to crown man as God, Christianity presents to us a Christ who calls us to repentance. It calls us not to strive towards the moral improved self. Through baptism, we don't become morally improved, but rather we are killed and then raised up again, not to celebrate the dawning of the new age, but to celebrate life as new creatures in Christ. Indeed, Luther was correct when he wrote that although hordes of devils fill the land, all eager to devour us, he, that is the devil, is defeated because, quote, for us fights the valiant one whom God himself elected. Thank you.